Grace, mercy, and peace be to you this All Saints Sunday, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. What is the point of all of this? What's the point of life? What's the point of the struggle? Why do we endure the suffering? Why do we gather here every Sunday and sing songs and pray? Why do we do any of those things? We ask these questions, and many in the world also ask these questions, although maybe even with a little less hope than we might. Some people ask that question about their own life. Why am I even alive? And some people have now started using that thinking to rationalize not even having children because it's cruel to bring them into such a world as ours. We ask these questions, and humans have asked them since anyone can remember, because they're sort of naturally things that occur to us as we live our lives. Why do we endure the things we endure? What's going to happen at the end of all of this? Where do things go after I die? Big questions, important questions. And one, a lot of these questions, the world answers are insufficient. They're shallow. The world may say something like, live like today is the last day you're alive. Live life to the fullest. Love deeply. Invest in your relationships. Create a lasting legacy. But those answers don't satisfy the deeper curiosity behind those questions of why am I here and what is the point of all of this? And why do I even get out of bed in the morning? What happens when I die? Why do I go to church? Where is all of this going? Well, there is one place that provides answers to those questions and more that fully satisfy the depth of our curiosity and really get at the core of why we ask those types of questions. And that place is God's Word. So today, as we delve into God's Word on this All Saints Day, I invite you to ponder those questions as I know you probably already have at one point or another, but to listen to the answers that God provides for us today in his word. So on All Saints, as I mentioned to the kids, we remember those in our lives, our family, our friends, our loved ones who have died in the faith, those who are no longer with us. And it can be a bittersweet day. Shortly after I became a pastor in 2016, My grandmother on my mom's side died in the faith, actually five years ago today. And it was just after that year's service of All Saints Day, which I am very grateful for. Because it hurts to lose somebody you love. The memories of your life with them, everybody's got those. You can close your eyes and you can picture the scenes. Some of you might even be able to picture the The sights and the sounds and the smells and the way you felt. With my grandma, it was all about traveling four hours. We lived four hours from St. Louis before we moved there when I was 11. And I always, I used to think that was such a long drive. Now it's not that long. And you get there and I would always wake up early on vacation. I don't know why when I was younger, but I never got up before my grandma. And she made pancakes from the Bisquick mix. She cooked them in bacon grease. They were really good. (laughs) And I remember quietly sitting at the breakfast table with her as we'd chat. She'd ask me about what's going on in my life as everybody else in the house started slowly waking up. Those kind of memories are important to us, and they stick with us. And on days like today, they sting a little when the person that you share them with is not there. Have you lost someone close to you this year or really at any point in time. Death's unforgiving presence is often what prompts the very questions that I started this sermon with. So often in our culture, we can ignore realities we don't wish to see. In my head, I always think of the fact that pretty much anywhere I go, I can even control the temperature in which I exist in. But death has a way of bursting through all of those things beyond our control and forcing us to confront things that often we try to avoid. And then the questions begin. 
What is the point of all of this? What happens when I die or when my loved ones die? Why endure this suffering? What's the point of all the activities of my life? Why do I even get out of bed in the morning? And often, after you lose someone close to you, many of those questions are fresh on your mind and you're asking them each morning. But today is not about death. In the Bible, we are taught, yes, that indeed the wages of sin are death. That is true. And we're again confronted with the reality of our mortality and the inevitability of our death in this life. But All Saints Day is not about death. It is about life. You see, the Bible does teach that the wages of sin is death, but that very same verse doesn't stop there. The second half of Romans 6.23 says this, But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, today is about life. Abundant life, not just any old earthly life, a renewed lease on life, or maybe 10 or 20 extra years on this earth, but a new, abundant, eternal life that we now have in Jesus. What is the point of all this? Why engage with the struggle and suffering that life in this world brings us? Because God loves you and wants to live with you forever. And not just you, but all who have faith in him. This joyous truth brings us the glorious picture of our new home in Revelation chapter 7. It's one of my favorite passages of scripture. Because it answers many of those questions that hit us when we're hurting. What happens to those who die in the faith? What's going to happen to me? Where is my grandma? Where is the person that I love who's died in the faith? Well, let's take a look at Revelation chapter 7. I'm going to reread portions of this text, and I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to imagine the scene that John has been given in this vision. A scene of the culmination of God's plan of salvation. A culmination of the story of God and his people. And I want you to envision being there. Picture the people that you're thinking of right now being there. After this I looked, and behold... A great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Can you see it? Can you picture that? Now, obviously, anything we come up with our imagination is but a pale comparison to the reality of the victorious throne of God that's being pictured here. And notice what all of the people are doing and the angels and the living creatures. They're doing the very thing that you and I have gathered this morning to do, worship our God. Isn't that an amazing picture? I don't know about you, but it always makes me think of, I've always wanted to be like in a crowd of like 10,000 people that like all know the same song or the same phrase and they yell it out at the same time. And if you've ever been there in some form of that, it's usually incredible. So can you imagine being amidst a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and people of languages throughout all time? standing before the throne and crying out loudly. It says with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Just an incredible scene. We can imagine it. This is the future. This is your future. This is your loved one's reality even now who has died in the faith. 
Christ saved you. He saved them. He possesses your salvation. That is what the praise is that they are shouting. That salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The one who sits on the throne is the one who is victorious. The one who is ruler over all. And that is where your God sits. But now you may be wondering, they've mentioned the great multitude, but where is the person that I know? Where is the person I'm thinking of? Well, it goes on in verses 13 and 14. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The great tribulation, the great struggle, the great trial. That's you. That's me. That's our loved ones who have died in the faith, that's all the saints of God. And their robes are white, pure white, washed in the blood of the Lamb. And so are yours. This is our future together with God and all those who believe in Him. This is the point. This is the culmination of the whole narrative of God, this eternal victory celebration of worship, sometimes described as the marriage feast, because sin, death, and the devil are no more. They've been defeated once and for all. And now you and me and all those who trust in Jesus are forever with God, surrounding his throne, singing his praises forever. Now, one of my favorite descriptions of our sort of regular, boring church worship is that it is the joining of heaven and earth. And that is what it is. When we gather around the altar of God and receive his gifts, we are joining the voices of all the saints throughout time in praise to God. We're joining the heavenly chorus that we read about here in Revelation chapter 7 in praising this great gift from God of eternal life, this new and abundant life that conquers death which is now ours through Jesus. That's what you're doing today, this morning. You're joining that heavenly multitude. You're joining your loved one who has preceded you in death and is where you will be when you die or when our Lord returns, singing praises together to our God. A phrase that helps epitomize the feeling of All Saints Day is this. It's a minor grief and a major hope. As Christians today, as we remember the saints who have gone before us in death, there is sorrow, there is hurt, and there should be because death was not part of God's plan. But it is a minor sorrow compared to the unsurpassing joy and peace and life in knowing that they are with God the one who loves them better than you, the one who loves them perfectly. And here is what happens when you're there. If you are one of those who's come out of the great tribulation, your robe has been washed white in the blood of the Lamb. And here is the reality that they now live in forever and which which we joyously anticipate as fellow saints of God. Therefore, They are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This comforts me so much when I think of my friends and family, my grandmother, who have died in the faith. And I pray that today through the the power 
and mystery of God's word, that you too are comforted in this promise of the resurrection, this certain future hope of eternal life. I know where they are, and now so do you. I know they are free from sin and suffering in a way I can't even understand yet. I know they are with God face to face. So we know, you and I, that through Jesus, we will see them again. So, what is the point of all of this? Why get out of bed in the morning? Why do we come to church and worship God? Well, look at Revelation 7. Behold it, as the author says. That is your future. That is the culmination of God's plan in Jesus for you. That is why he made you and me. That is why he redeemed you and me. And that is where you and I and all other throughout time and space who have faith in Jesus will be forever. In the name of Jesus. Amen.